So thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Thank you, Mount Sinai. I'm a Mount Sinai graduate, so it's actually kind of fun to be back. I did my training through the city hospital system in Mount Sinai, so a lot of fun to be back with all of you. Uh, thank you, of course, to the Alexandra Cohen Foundation, uh, to the Bay Area Lime that funded uh, the data mining that you're about to see. Um, and thank you, of course, to the researchers. Everything I'm going to show you this afternoon is based on all the hard work and the great research that you have done in the laboratory. And as I'll show you, I'd be taking the work that Dr. Zhang discussed this morning, uh, that Dr. Embers discussed, uh, that Dr. Nicole Baumgart discussed, and I'll show you applying it in our patient population uh, what we're actually finding. So being on the tick-borne disease working group, there was a big question that came up uh, in our last meeting of, what exactly is chronic Lyme disease? We know how to define PTLDS, but what is chronic Lyme? So what I'm gonna show you is a study where we took 200 patients on a persister drug regimen called Dapsone Combination Therapy. Dapsone's usually used for treating leprosy. It's a mycobacterium drug. Um, the advantage of using it is it not only hits persisters, but it has an anti-inflammatory effect. It has an anti-malarial effect against parasites like Babesia. Um, and they use it in autoimmune disease like Bisset. So it's a very interesting drug, and I got these ideas basically from Dr. Zhang and from the other researchers. And we took 657 volumes of charts and we data mined the 16-point MSIDS model that I've been working on. Uh, and this is a two-year study taking a look at what we found. Uh, the main disclaimer is that the views expressed in this presentation do not represent the views of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, HHS, or the United States. And again, uh, thank you so much for the grants from Bay Area Lyme and the MSIDS Research Foundation. So I'm a board-certified internist. I've seen over 13,000 chronic Lyme patients at this point over three decades. We learn in medical school pastor's postulate. There's one cause for one disease. So what I put forth to you is what if there were multiple overlapping causes of inflammation affecting Lyme symptoms that makes it very difficult to do some of these double-blind placebo-controlled trials because we've not ruled out some of these subsets of patients that have other sources of inflammation and have downstream effects of that inflammation. So this MSIDS model, MSIDS stands for Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome. Uh, this is a model that I developed over the past decade looking at up to 16 reasons why Lyme patients stay sick. And we sometimes describe it as the three eyes, multiple infections causing immune dysfunction and inflammation. So this was a two-year study. It involved a patient symptom survey and retrospective chart review of 200 patients. As I said, I sat there and data mined 657 volumes of charts myself, having to pull out the data with other researchers and then had people enter it into an Excel file, working with statisticians with an SPSS program. The whole goal of this was to, number one, better define chronic Lyme disease, to diagnose abnormalities on the 16-point MSIDS map that potentially affected health, and pinpoint overlapping sources of inflammation and their downstream effects to improve clinical outcome. And finally, to evaluate the efficacy of this Dapsone combination therapy, which is basically doing translational medicine, taking from the lab, Dr. Zhang's work on persisters and tuberculosis, and putting it into a clinical setting along with biofilm busters. So when I tell you about this study, it used three intracellular drugs, doxycycline, rifampin, and Dapsone. We use three biofilm busters, stevia, oregano oil, and biocidin, and we use three probiotics, which were over uh, 200 billion, including Saccharomyces boulardii, which has been shown to prevent C. diff diarrhea. So when we look at this map, you can divide it up into the primary sources of inflammation on the left-hand side, uh, chronic infections. There could, of course, be dysbiosis of the intestinal bacteria. That's been talked about with the microbiome research in the last uh, decade, where now they're finding, for example, Prevotella in rheumatoid arthritis or Clostridium species in multiple sclerosis. Um, we looked for leaky gut with food allergies because that has been shown to cause the same inflammatory cytokine production that you get with Lyme. Lyme patients, as we know, don't sleep, which can drive interleukin-6, which is one of the inflammatory cytokines that makes people sick with Lyme. And then we also looked at environmental toxins like heavy metals and mold, because these are showing up in the literature, the mold toxins specifically for chronic fatigue syndrome, but also heavy metals and environmental toxins are now showing up in the autoimmune literature uh, in quite a few journals. And finally, we looked for nutritional deficiencies because if you have copper deficiency needed for superoxide dismutase, you can't handle free radical oxidative stress. If you have zinc deficiency, that's going to drive your cytokine production. 
But what's not been accounted for in the double-blind placebo-controlled studies is the downstream effects of what happens when you have inflammation. So I'm gonna show you the effects on endocrine system on the HPA axis, uh, where we did find low testosterone in men in their 20s and 30s. Uh, we found low adrenal function in up to 70% of the patients we looked at. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about neurological, psychological dysfunction, uh, POTS dysautonomia, which was found in up to 41.5% of these patients. And the reason this is important is if you're doing a study where you're looking at fatigue, dizziness, palpitations, anxiety, memory concentration problems, those are all symptoms of Lyme disease, but they're also symptoms of POTS dysautonomia. And they're obviously treated completely differently. One is supporting the blood pressure, and the other one is treating with antibiotics. We then looked at mitochondrial dysfunction, pain syndromes, liver dysfunction, and autoimmune phenomenon. The labs that we use to test the MSIDS variables will several national reference laboratories. We use local state laboratories. And then we use specialty laboratories for tick-borne diseases, including Imogen, Igenix, MDL, Stony Brook Lyme Disease Laboratory, Milford Molecular Diagnostics. Uh, some patients came in with Galaxy results, which we can't do for Bartonella in New York and Immunosciences. And then several different functional medicine laboratories looking at adrenal function, looking at heavy metals and mold toxins. So this was the percentage of patients among these 200 people that had EM rashes. Uh, it was only 19% in our study that were positive for EM. And what's interesting about the CDC IgM Western blots is it showed up in 45% of the patients. And that's exactly what we're seeing with some of the prior studies done by uh, John and Allison that was published in Clinical Rheumatology, where we see a lot more IgM Western blots. And I'll go in just a little bit to show you how this fits in exactly with what Nicole was talking about this morning. We only had 10% of the patients who were CDC positive IgG Western blot, which fits, John, the study you just showed at 9.8%. It was a little bit less in the study published a few years ago. And then we looked at the number of co-infections. Two-thirds of our patients approximately had between five and eight co-infections. This doesn't mean they're all active. It just means we found antibody evidence and sometimes by PCR and RNA. So we found 13.5% with anaplasmosis. Um, we found Bartonella hensley uh, with Quintana up to 46.5%. And this has, of course, been debated in the literature. There's only one study in Europe that Ixodes ricinus ticks can transmit Bartonella. Uh, Brucella, 10%. Uh, typhus, 10.5%. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, 10%. And it was a bit surprising to actually find the levels of tularemia titers were 16.5%. Now, remember, this is a subgroup of 200 patients. I would say over the years, it's not necessarily that high with all of these numbers, but what's important, the common denominator, is many of these patients had multiple intracellular infections. So using a triple intracellular drug combo to go after multiple infections at the same point in time might be useful. For Babesia microti and Duncani, by antibodies, we found 52% positive, Toxo 11.5%. And then you can see we checked for herpes viruses. HHV6 was obviously high because it's from roseola in childhood. But what was fascinating is the West Nile was 6.5%. And what's disturbing about that is the flaviviruses like Zika and West Nile are known to persist. We don't know with Powassan virus, which is a flavivirus, but this is very concerning, that we may have several chronic viral infections going on at the same point as having bacterial infections. So this is kind of broadly what this looks at, looks like in this 200 uh, Dapsone study. Most of the patients you can see with Babesia, these were also PCR, fish, fluorescent and C2 hybridization positive with antibody, and then Bartonella, and you can see again a smattering of all of these other co-infections. We then looked at the Babesia testing to see how many people had Babesia microti versus Babesia duncani. Now, normally, Babesia duncani has not supposed to spread to the northeastern United States, and I'll show you the study in just a second what it showed. But what was interesting is we did find Babesia fish, fluorescent in situ hybridization, positive in almost 40% of these patients when we couldn't find antibodies. So the numbers of Duncani and Microti were pretty much equal. Duncani actually was a little bit more. Some patients had evidence of both antibody titers, but among the 32 patients who were seronegative for both Microti and Duncani, 37.5% were positive by direct testing. So this kind of tells us that if you're going to screen for Babesia, if you have a patient 
with day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger where they can't catch their breath. And you've done a differential diagnosis as we're taught in internal medicine. Do they have hyperthyroidism? Do they have malaria? Do they have tuberculosis? Do they have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Are they in menopause, right? You do a differential diagnosis for sweats, we would always find that when the sweats came back, we would find proof of active babesiosis. And then we looked at where these patients came from in the Northeastern United States and across the US, and we found that 49 of these 175 patients, Babesia duncani was showing up in the Northeast, and we mapped the states that they came from, and you can see when they called it WA1 babesiosis, because it initially originated from Washington, you can see that at least it appears that duncani has spread now across the United States. Now, this needs to be confirmed because there's only 13 confirmed CDC positive Babesia duncani cases. So this needs to be confirmed, but the reason it's important is because babesiosis has made it into the blood supply. It can be transmitted uh, in pregnancy from pregnant women to their fetuses, and I've treated pregnant women who relapsed during their third trimester, and solid organ transplantation, you can also see uh, babesiosis. And then we looked at persistence, but not just Lyme, but all of these other co-infections. And what we found is 14.5% of these patients were PCR positive, despite adequate antibiotic therapy for months or years prior to dapsone combination therapy. With Babesia, we found positive PCRs or fish testing, despite the classical drugs used for Babesiosis, like Atovaquone and Zithromax, or Clindamycin and Quinine. We found Bartonella hensile positive with single, double, and triple intracellular drug therapies by PCR and FISH. And occasionally, the tularemia titers reactivated with fourfold increases. We would have brucella titers turn positive by agglutination. And we found occasionally HHV6 titers go up with positive PCRs for HHV6, which is very interesting based on uh, Joel Dudley's work, because these were patients who are immune compromised, which I'll show you in just a second. And then we found some strains of mycoplasma that people don't usually look for. Mycoplasma fermentans has been found in ticks, and we found 2.5% by PCR and 1% of mycoplasma penetrans. So when we looked at these 16 points that we were screening, you could see at least 70% of the time, people had immune dysfunction, inflammation, toxins, allergies, nutritional deficiencies. The lowest ones on there were uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, which I'll show you the reason why I think uh, it's underestimated. POTS dysautonomia was about 41%, and then deconditioning about a third of the patients. So let's look in a little bit greater detail now at what we found. So apart from the high numbers of Babesia and Bartonella in this subgroup, we found immune dysfunction, which we classified by a positive anti-nuclear antibody. Now, only two patients had a double-stranded DNA, which is the specific marker for lupus, and we found a lot of rheumatoid factors, but only one of those patients was positive by CCP, which is the specific marker for rheumatoid arthritis. These were also patients that were HLA DR2 or 4 positive, right, more of an immune response with Herx's. 72.5% had immune dysfunction, but what was fascinating based on what we saw about Nicole Baumgoss work is 13.5% had elevated IgM antibodies and up to 85% had some form of immune deficiency. So you heard this morning that if you don't have adequate IgG antibodies, you can't fight infection. 20.6% of these patients, and we put in the immunoglobulins twice, so in 200 patients, there were 400 sets of data points because they were tested at least twice, 20.6% with IgG deficiency, 19.3% with IgM deficiency, 15.9% with IgA deficiency, which would lead you to have a higher rate of allergies, of food allergies, but we had 85% with combined subclass deficiencies, one through four. And when you break this down to subclass one and subclass three on the left under low, you'll notice that those were the subclasses, 27.61% for one and subclass three, 31%. These were the lowest subclasses we found, especially subclass one and subclass three deficiency in these patients. Now, the, the reason this is important is because of the 60% that had these low IgG subclasses one and three, this can affect phagocytosis and antibody-dependent cellular complement-dependent cytotoxicity. And there's a grouping of these patients who do not have a positive pneumococcal response um, who had chronic variable immune deficiency.
The problem in figuring out the chicken or the egg, was it Borrelia causing it, or did they have immune deficiency and then get Lyme, is that we not only found Lyme, but we found other things affecting immunity. Anaplasmosis, for example, has been known to cause immune dysfunction, just as do heavy metals like mercury, which can act as a haptin on the outside of the cells, and gliotoxins, which I'll show you we found in 100% of our patients tested positive for mold, which are immunosuppressive. So again, Nicole had talked about that this morning where Borrelia can subvert a B-cell response to an IgM skewed profile. That's pretty much what we found in this patient population with IgG deficiency, 7% with chronic variable immune deficiency, and normally in the general population, it's only supposed to be one in 25,000 to one in 50,000 that gets chronic variable immune deficiency. One out of 14 patients in the study had CVID. And 13%, as I said, had high IgM, almost 20% low IgM, which made me think whether the low IgM antibodies, the deficiency maybe suggested immune complexes with active disease, similar to what Steve Schutzer had published years ago in Lancet, where there's sequestration of antibody to Borrelia burgdorferi in immune complexes in seronegative Lyme disease. So we looked in the literature to see what has been published on subclasses for Lyme, and we found a study that was published 20 years ago that the prior examination of the subclass distribution in Lyme borreliosis, the predominant subclasses in the serum and CSF were IgG1 and IgG3, the exact opposite of what we found in this chronically ill patient population. And the theory is that the interferon gamma predominated immune response results in production of IgG1 in three subclasses that are complement activating and opsonizing, and that increased levels of those two subclasses early in the disease might contribute to recovery and counteract chronicity. So in our chronic patient, it was exactly the opposite. It was low subclass one and three. So we need to look at this in further studies to see if this is a marker of predisposition for chronic Lyme? Is it a marker of active Lyme, just like with the low IgM, possibly representing immune complex? We then looked at inflammatory markers, SED rates, CRP, TGF-beta-1, C3A, C4A, TNF-alpha, and vascular endothelial growth factor. Although they're not specific for Lyme, CRP is an indirect marker of IL-6. We can find C4A in both Lyme and mold toxicity, and almost 70% had inflammation. With the environmental toxins, we found almost 85% had one or more heavy metals using six hour and urea DMSA challenge. About 80% had elevated lead levels, which can cause fatigue, neuropathy, encephalopathy. Almost 70% had elevated mercury levels. 15% with cadmium levels, which has been associated with prostate cancer, breast cancer, and kidney disease. And 12.5% with aluminum levels, and the reason this is, might be important is because there's theories about viruses and bacteria now being responsible for Alzheimer's, and we know in the literature that they have found that aluminum can cause neurofibrillary tangles in some of these patients. We then looked at mold toxins in patients who said, I've been exposed. 71.4% had one or more mold levels. Aflatoxins, ochratoxins, trichothicines, and 100% with gliotoxins, which are immunosuppressive, with almost 40% having positive stachybotrys exposure to black mold. Now, we didn't check people regularly for pesticides. We only checked them if they had Parkinsonian symptoms, and we did find 2.5% showed up positive. The CDC, by the way, had done a $6.5 million study in 2013 and showed that there's 113 different pollutants getting into people's bodies, so none of this actually should be very surprising. Allergies, we found over 80% had some form of allergies, 45% primarily food allergies. This is important because the literature has shown that it can stimulate the same cytokine production that you can get with Lyme. We didn't find a lot with high histamine, but I did not screen all patients for mast cell activation disorder, and certainly that shows up in some patients. 76% had one or more nutritional deficiencies, copper, magnesium, and zinc, which as I said is important for free radical oxidative stress, for clearing toxins with magnesium, which is needed in 300 detox enzymes, and zinc. Mitochondrial was only 7.5%, but prior literature showed up to a third of patients with Lyme symptoms responded. I think because the patients responded to dapsone combination therapy, it was difficult to see the difference. 88.5% reported at least one psychological problem, primarily depression and anxiety, some with OCD, PTSD. 
This is very important, as Bob Bransfield has pointed out, because of the suicide rates, where we have to be very careful among patients who are depressed with Lyme. 95% had one or more neurological symptoms, with 94% having neuropathy, 2.5% with chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and a small number with MS and seizures. Endocrine abnormalities, almost 100%, 60% with thyroid, 72% with adrenal, which was important, because if you're tired and your adrenals are low, you're not gonna respond to antibiotics in the same manner. 41% had low testosterone and low sex hormones, and then you could see DHEA and pregnenolone, which are precursors of both your adrenal and sex hormones, were low. 98% had one or more sleep disorders. Interestingly enough, 11.5% had obstructive sleep apnea, and this included young, thin women, which means that even though you may not suspect it, you should do sleep studies on patients who can fall asleep, but do a differential diagnosis for restless leg, BPH, menopause, medication-induced sleep problems, but most of this is circadian rhythm disorders secondary to Lyme. POTS dysautonomia was 41.5%. Half of the women who have come to me in wheelchairs over the years who are unable to walk out of a wheelchair got out of a wheelchair by simply treating their dysautonomia and raising their blood pressure. It had nothing to do with treating their Lyme, and I would suggest to clinicians in the audience, please look very carefully at POTS dysautonomia. It shows up in quite a few patients, and it has been published in the medical literature. And then we found some dysautonomia with gastroparesis, chronic constipation, bladder dysfunction, or temperature dysregulation. Uh, almost 80% had one or more GI abnormalities, 10% uh, combined with gluten sensitivity or celiac, 21.5% with candida, which mimics Lyme symptoms, 17% um, with parasites, which is important because babesiosis suppresses your immune system's ability to get rid of other parasitic infections. But you'll notice not one person had C. difficile during dapsone combination therapy for a minimum of seven months. Elevated liver function showed up in 74%. Lyme, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Borrelia miyamotoi, um, relapsing fever, all of the co-infections can cause it, but we did find one patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and one patient with hemochromatosis. Pain syndromes, the 15-point, 92.5%, had migratory pain. In a study we published just last year, we showed that migratory pain is the hallmark of Lyme. It only shows up in seven diseases altogether in medicine. And these inflammatory cytokines, which produce pain, can be formed by not only infections, but environmental toxins. And finally, about a third of the patients needed physical therapy because uh, of their pain or POTS dysautonomia. So two years ago, I did a study on Dapsone as a novel persister drug for Lyme in 100 patients. Now we have paired sample t-tests for 200 patients, pre-dapsone and dapsone, and you'll see that the p-values were less than 0.001 for all of the major Lyme symptoms, fatigue, pain, neuropathy, sleep problems, and cognition. And when we looked at John's study on 124 patients with PDLDS, where 92% had a level of cognitive difficulty, which he just told you about, but only 26% had significant cognitive decline, and our 165 patients with Lyme MSID, 91% self-reported some level of difficulty, very similar numbers, but our group with moderate, moderately severe or severe cognitive impairment was three times higher at 78%. And despite these multiple overlapping etiologies causing inflammation, this dapsone group did significantly improve cognition. And we feel that it's because it has excellent central nervous system penetration, it has antibacterial effects by stopping RNA and protein production by the bacteria, it works against a broad range of pathogens, it's efficacious against different forms of Borrelia, including round body stationary phase and biofilm forms that Dr. Zhang talked to you about this morning. And finally, Dapsone has an anti-inflammatory effect by converting myeloperoxidase into its inactive product, which is the same mechanism that clofazamine is used as a persister drug. So how do we improve patients' health? At least in our clinic, we have to find all the overlapping sources of inflammation the chronic infections, the environmental toxins, the GI issues, sleep disorders, but we have to treat the downstream effects of inflammation. The autoimmune phenomenon, we use Plaquenil hydroxychloroquine regularly with DMARDs. We do have a fair amount of patients on IVIG. Um, you've got to shut down the production of these cytokines. Some of that could be using natural products to decrease NF-kappa B, uh, nitric oxide. 
You have to remove cytokines and neurotoxins like quinolinic acid. Uh, glutathione, which is part of your liver detox pathway, is very effective for some of these people with cognitive difficulties. You have to repair the mitochondria that do not have histones surrounding it like chromosomes, replace the hormones, and finally treat the POTS dysautonomia. Thank you so much for your attention.